Welcome everyone. Begin in a, another couple of minutes. Make yourselves comfortable. Welcome, good to see you all. Good morning. Good morning, can everyone hear me okay? Let me check my settings just to be sure. Okay, yep. hopefully that's good. Okay, great, thank you. I always have to fix them in Zoom. Good to be here again with you. I see you now, Marilyn. Good to have you here again. So I'm once again uh, filling in for Daryl today. Hi, Anne. Two Anne's with us today. Hello, Anne. It's good to be here. I've already started the recording, um, but I'm spotlighted, so you won't be on the recording, uh, not to worry. <laughs> good to see you. And Veronique is here as well. Um, so let's... Um, Let's wait one more minute. Perhaps others may still join. It's being recorded as well and we'll post it on the, hello, good to see you. We'll post it on the YouTube site after. Just make yourselves comfortable. We're gonna begin, we're gonna begin with uh, land acknowledgement and a uh, little bit of chanting. And then we'll move into uh, Dharma talk a brief Dharma talk, and then a practice, and we'll have some time for sharing at the end. Welcome, Zuri. Hi. Hi. So we'll, um, we'll get started, just beginning with a brief land acknowledgement. Um, reminding you to check in with yourself as well on your intentions for engaging in the land acknowledgement um, and connecting with maybe gratitude, appreciation for the land that you're on. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to reside, to live on this territory to, to work here as well as a diasporic immigrant settler on this land. And I acknowledge the sacred land, all of the gifts and resources that I've received and benefited from. And I feel a deep sense of gratitude for being here, for being here in this space, um, this TNI space, as well as the physical space that I'm in, the land that I live on. Um, it has been and continues to be the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. And many say much, much longer than that, thousands of years longer. 
Um, this land where I'm um, residing is the city of Toronto, known as Toronto. It's the territory of the Huron Wendat and the Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabek, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and it's covered by Treaty 13. So my intention is to support and care for this land and its peoples and the peoples that this land belongs to in whatever way that I can, um, through raising awareness, fostering inclusion and connection, through sharing, mutual caring and living peaceably on this land. Um, and always my wish to create a safer and braver space, contribute to inclusivity um, for people of various identities and backgrounds, and cultures, intersectionalities that we may find ourselves navigating. So I'll give you a moment just to reflect on your own intentions, your own wishes for how you want to be here and live here wherever you are. Maybe appreciating something specific that you love about this land, some gratitude for um, maybe a particular tree or flower, um, really fragrant this time of year. Beautiful flowers budding, whatever it is that you appreciate. And then releasing this um, contemplation, um, I want to welcome you again. It's it's a real pleasure to be here once once more with you, and I'll be continuing on um, the work that Daryl has been doing over the last many weeks of um, discussing and sharing the teachings of the Satipatthana Sutta, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. I'd like to um, first do a little bit of chanting. So I'm going to share um, a slide with some chanting and feel free to join in where you are, if you wish, or just listen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Maybe show of hands if, if you can see it. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. So um, sitting in some way that feels comfortable for you, you can bring your palms together um, like this in Anjali Mudra or place them one palm in the other on your lap, whatever feels right for you. And so um, taking refuge, we'll begin by honoring the Buddha paying homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one, perfectly awakened one. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. And then taking refuge. Um, translation to the Buddha, I go for refuge. To the Dhamma, I go for refuge. To the Sangha, I go for refuge. And we repeat this three times for the second time. To the Buddha, I go for refuge. To the Dhamma, I go for refuge. And to the Sangha, I go for refuge. And for the third time, to the Buddha, I go for refuge. To the Dhamma, I go for refuge. And to the Sangha, I go for refuge. Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Sangham Saranam Gachami. 
Dutiampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dutiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Sadhu 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 Um, I find it a really uh, grounding practice to chant. It's, it's part of a tradition that I grew up in. There's a lot of singing, a lot of chanting. And so um, it's kind of nice for me to share this and, and to be able to chant every morning, this short chant or a longer one um, with the precepts as well. Um, it can be a nice way to kind of ease into practice and to really settle the, the mind, um, vocalizing uh, in a soothing way, in a supportive way, can really help to regulate the nervous system if you know, there's some anxiety or restlessness or worry, um, just to kind of really focus in on, um, even if you don't remember exactly what the words mean to focus in on the sounds and how it feels as you're vocalizing. And so you, you may already have this practice or you may wish to kind of add it to your daily practice um, if you have one. Um, and today, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the Satipatthana Sutta. But in particular, um, I'll continue on with uh, the five hindrances. And uh, last time um, we focused on uh, aversion. We talked a lot about aversion. And this time I'd like to focus on the fourth um, hindrance, which is restlessness and worry. So I'll remind you just a little bit, very, very brief overview of the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness Sutta. This is one of the two um, primary suttas that the Buddha taught uh, that are practice-related, practice-based. And the Satipatthana Sutta contains pretty much all the teachings within it. It's, it's quite amazing, this teaching. And um, so the four foundations of mindfulness are body, feelings, specifically feeling tone, mind, and the last foundation is mental qualities or dhammas or phenomena. So this includes the hindrances that we're going to talk about today, the aggregates, which make up a sense of ourself, um, the sixth sense doors the seven factors of awakening, the four noble truths. So these are some of the key teachings contained within the, the Dhamma, the, the exploration of the mental qualities. Um, and from the um, Majjhima Nikaya, this uh, number 10, the Satipatthana Sutta, um, there is the case where a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances. And the five hindrances are said to be um, kind of like blocks to practice. So they get in the way of your individual um, journey um, on the path. And they can also uh, get in the way of uh, concentration and um, paying attention when practicing mindfulness. They can come up in mindfulness of breathing, for example. Uh, when the mind wanders, often it's because of one of these hindrances. So they are, I'll remind you, the first one is sensual desire or kind of like attachment, uh, wanting, wanting something. 
The next one is ill will or aversion. It's also connected with um, hatred, um, pushing away, not wanting something. Um, the third is sloth and torpor. It can be like a listlessness, a like um, maybe sleepiness could be part of this. And then the fourth is restlessness and remorse. And this is the one we're going to talk about more today. But I also connected with the emotion of anxiety, um, busyness, you know, that we have in our lives, moving from thing to thing. I think social media fits into this one. Um, you know, this, um, the pinging, the, the sounds, the constant kind of pull for attention from, from focus technology, um, sort of modern day phenomena that we encounter. Um, and the fifth one is skeptical doubt, skeptical doubt. So that's um, doubt in ourselves, doubt in the teachings, doubt in the practice, that the practice is working. Um, maybe doubt in the world as we know it in our society, things like that. So the Buddha stressed that in order to bring meaning and value into your life, one needs to master yourself and not let the hindrances stop you. So there, these hindrances are inherently a part of our conditioning, our habitual patterns of reactivity that we've learned over our lifetime, from childhood and even from previous uh, lifetimes. So um, there are four ways to align and structure our lives to prevent the hindrances or kind of be with them in a, in a skillful way, manage them in a skillful way. Um, recognizing the hindrance. So recognizing, knowing that it's present is very helpful. That's the first step. So that's the mindfulness, the mindfulness of the hindrance. Um, and then accepting and acknowledging whatever is going on, the situation and the person, and letting it be. This is hard, right? This is hard for us because we don't like to accept. We kind of jump, jump to reactivity if we're not aware. And then we investigate, um, why is this happening? You know, what is the source of this, really? What's really going on here? And, and we need to kind of ask this question several times and go deeper each time, I think. And then what are the consequences of this hindrance? Like what does it really mean if we fall into this? Or maybe even what does it mean to not be under the influence of this hindrance? And then remembering to non-identify. So like a decentering kind of quality. Uh, remembering that I am not the body. Like the body is my vessel, it's my, my vehicle, but I am not this. I am not the mind. I am not the emotion. So you can observe these. You know, as an observer, you can sit in practice or go through your daily life and observe, but is there a substantial fixed Self that exists in the body or in the mind or in our emotions or in, the, in, in our everyday. And so this is the, linked to that concept of um, like no, no self. You know, there's no fixed permanent self that, that is going to last forever. And so um, reading a little bit more from the sutta. Um, how does a monk practice uh, mind object contemplation on the mental objects of the five hindrances? When restlessness and remorse are present in him, the monk knows. And so by the monk, you know, nowadays we, we can be anyone practicing. So um, in those days in this in the sutta, it was monk, but it could be uh, anyone engaging in practice, a uh, member of the Sangha, of the community. There are restlessness and remorse in me. So we know there are restlessness and remorse in me. 
or when agitation and remorse are absent, he knows there are no restlessness and remorse in me. He knows how the arising of non-arisen restlessness and remorse comes to be, how it arises. He knows how the rejection of the arisen restlessness and remorse comes to be, how we engage with it and, and kind of overcome it. And he knows how the non-arising in the future of the rejected restlessness and remorse comes to be. So how does it come about? What are its forces? What makes it happen? And so really fully understanding it from all these perspectives, and, and all of the suttas have this kind of repetitive quality, um, yet not repetitive, you know, it's like really exploring it from every angle possible to understand it fully. Um, Jack Cornfield Quirn calls this obstacles um, that are part of the path. When we are on the path of awakening, of learning, of realization, these are obstacles that can show up. And anxiety is linked to future thinking. Agitation is about uh, maybe not liking things as they are, not wanting to be in this moment because it's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant. So distraction, so you, you, you may have noticed at some point sitting in meditation and you know, waking up with this kind of um, restless feeling or somehow feeling like something isn't right or something bugging me, you know, I've forgotten something I don't like something. Maybe I don't want to see something. Um, I'm feeling that kind of angst, the, the antsiness, the busyness. So that's one of my favorites, busyness. Um, just kind of filling time, filling time up with uh, all kinds of activities so that, you know, it's so hard to be present. And for some of us, um, you know, this may go back, uh, way, way back, uh, you know, not feeling, maybe not feeling safe when we're still, maybe it's not safe to be still, or maybe it's not, uh, maybe we need to be constantly evading or moving around. Um, maybe it's scary to think about the things that come up or to feel what's showing up in the body to be with that agitation or with that restlessness. Um, and sometimes it's contraindicated to meditate. You know, it's actually not the right thing to do. Maybe movement is the right thing to do, to take care of that. So yoga, walking, running, and then the body can kind of maybe settle. And sometimes those activities, um, actually bring out more of the anxiety. So it's really individual and personal. For me, it's both. I, I really appreciate movement. It takes care of a lot of my excess energy. Um, and I really have to have learned over time to sit more with it and really examine it. And the key for me in accepting the things I didn't like or didn't want to see, didn't want happening, within myself or in relationship with others or in the world was acceptance. And for me, that was a big one. And really getting curious about what is this? You know, that is said to be um, one of the antidotes of restlessness, like curiosity, really sitting with it, really examining it, getting curious about it. And we'll practice this a little bit in the practice we're gonna do. So when we examine our own minds, we're going to inevitably encounter um, greed, um, hatred, and delusion, right? So fear, prejudice, wanting, desire, not wanting, aversion. Um, and these create a lot of suffering in the world, in ourselves and in the rest of the world. They can also be an opportunity you know, for exploration, for highlighting for us. So again, like not judging ourselves because we've been conditioned in this way, but also then once we know, we can't kind of unknow it. 
All right, so it's important to remember this is what's going on. So they raise this kind of central question for anyone who undertakes this path. We're on this path for a reason, right? We want to awaken. Ignorance is not bliss. Maybe we think it's bliss sometimes, but it's not bliss, right? Um, because then those things are gonna keep repeating themselves over and over again. Whatever is our thing, whatever that is, family stuff, I don't know, work stuff, relationship stuff. It's, you know, whatever our things are that we deal with. Um, so is there a skillful way to work with these energies? Um, so understanding the nature of our happiness and sorrow, that's pretty much the, the, the crux of it all, of understanding what is suffering and why do we suffer? That's what the Buddha set out to do, right? Thousands of years ago. How do we find freedom from this kind of suffering? Um, we have to be willing to face all of the demons. You know, when he sat under the Bodhi tree meditating, Mara came to him. All of the demons came to him and he had to look at each one and face it head on. He didn't just sit there doing nothing, right? He was actually actively engaged in the process of awakening. Um, so depending on our relationship to these hindrances, uh, they can be a cause of a huge struggle, huge, huge struggle. So anxiety is a very, very big one for me. And I see it in my clients, you know, my psychotherapy practice, um, a lot of anxiety, um, a lot in like in secular mindfulness programs and so on. And, you know, you can imagine during COVID as well, like how much anxiety, um, has been present, like fear, you know, fear-driven anxiety. Am I safe? Can I even step out on the street and get close to someone? I, I went to an event a couple of weeks ago and I was shocked at how many people were there, you know, in one place, um, really close, close together. And since COVID, it's been this real, like, hard to get used to being in a place with lots and lots of people. And this is part of that kind of anxiety, the fear, Am I okay? So it could be like uh, we might feel like our safety, our very safety, our survival is being threatened. And there's lots of things in the world that make us feel that way. So all kinds of anxieties that we feel and others feel. And so depending on the relationship, um, it can be a struggle, but also a valuable um, tool for insight if we're willing to look at it. And if we can look at it, sometimes we need help, right? Sometimes we need to do this with the help of a therapist or what we, what we call a Kalyana Mita, a spiritual friend, you know, in Sangha together or with a teacher, um, someone who's been through it, who, who is going through it, who knows, you know, how to support you. Um, this is the, the beauty and the value of Sangha as well, of community. So the first step, as we said, is to identify the hindrance clearly. So restlessness is here, worry is here, remorse is here, remorse, or maybe guilt, agitation, busyness is here. You know, I wanna, I don't feel comfortable in my own skin right now, in this moment, in this space even, I need to get out of here, I need to move, I need to run. Um, so, and so these are uh, the hindrances. And so to concentrate and see clearly, it said, concentrate and see clearly, we must overcome restlessness and worry because they're kind of like a cloud, like a, like a maybe like a delusion, delusion cloud or something. Um, so investigating them is like um, learning, um, learning to cultivate instead of just accepting, you know, so, uh, so cultivating this um, energy of presence. And um, rather than assuming that, you know, they'll just go away or pushing them away. So it takes time, it takes time. Um, the literal translation of the word restlessness, 
udacha uh, means to shake. So it's a state of agitation or over-excitement, like shaking. Um, so we live restless lives in our society. There's lots of activity that can channel restlessness. Um, however, we need to really sort of confront this energy. Um, and these activities can be um, skillful or unskillful, whatever we engage in. And it's uncomfortable, so it can be hard to pay attention to this energy. Um, and it, it's also a symptom of maybe having difficulty being present for discomfort. So when the discomfort is here, we need to cultivate, really encourage ourselves and in, in a kind way, you know, in a compassionate way of uh, having more patience and, and a kind of discipline um, and courage to, to sit still and face it, you know, to be with it. So um, there can be physical restlessness and it may come through the body as like a compulsive energy, like a bouncing around. We can't get comfortable in meditation. We need to move hard to find that sweet spot. Um, we may have the impulse to fidget or even leave the room, you know, if there's a lot of stillness. Um, and it can be like, um, like a vulnerability or an agitation that maybe comes from too much sugar or too much caffeine, you know, that kind of jumpy feeling. Um, and restlessness can be mental as well. So it can come, um, come on as a rumination, scattered thinking, not being able to focus or, or be clear or concentrate or um, follow kind of a pattern of logic, um, persistent thinking. And, and when we're distracted, it's present. So whenever we're, say we're trying to meditate, um, breathe, sitting, focusing on the breath, and then we get distracted by, I don't know, planning or worry about the future or something we need to do or something we don't like. Um, so, um, so we might be unable to, uh, to focus and the mind can resist this direction towards focus. Maybe it's not used to it or it's just used to kind of jumping from one thing to the next. Um, Sometimes it's called like a monkey mind. Um, and so the restless mind, when we can focus it on one thing, when we can start to cultivate this, it can be really, um, really powerful and, and also challenging. But the more that we do it, we might create these new kind of neural patterns, you know, the habitual patterns. Um, Restlessness can also show up about excitement, about being in a state of peace in meditation. So it's kind of um, sneaky in that way. Um, and so it can interrupt, you know, that state of presence um, and get triggered that way. But it can also be um, linked to clinging as well, clinging to or attachment to a state um, that we like and then worrying. So the second part of restlessness is worry. Um, kukucha is the Pali word. And feelings of regret for what we have or haven't done in the past. Um, worrying about the future, um, our sense of self, um, are we going to be who we think we are or should be? Is are our lives going to be as we think they should be? Um, you know, comparing, this happens a lot in, in media. We compare ourselves to others. Am I doing as well in my career as my colleague from university? Or did I make the right decisions? Or should I have done this or that? Or, you know, um, so this kind of anxiety about our self, 
our self-image is threatened, our sense of self, um, maybe guilt or shame. And sometimes we are shamed or guilted by other people. So we can internalize this as well. Um, so these are some of the, the ways that it shows up. And sometimes restlessness can be overwhelming. So it's really hard for some people. Um, maybe they've faced some real difficulty um, or unsafety in, in their lives. And I see this a lot and sometimes even feel it myself that it can be overwhelming. And so in, when it becomes overwhelming, we need to kind of take a step back and maybe even stop practice. Maybe do something else that is um, skillful where we can pay attention, but in a different way. So kind of like um, engaging with the five senses, you know, what can I see right now? What can I feel? What can I hear? Or uh, walking mindfully can be helpful or, or like a gentle movement like yoga or qigong can be helpful to kind of settle, settle that restless energy. And maybe it means doing shorter practice, you know, so there's lots of ways that um, we can approach this, this energy. Um, restlessness is the opposite of torpor. Um, and uh, it's also compared to um, water with uh, like, um, like a disturbance on the surface of the water as a hindrance. I have some slides actually that um, I'll show you briefly. This is just kind of the reminder of what are the hindrances. Restlessness is the fourth. And this one that I showed last time, um, the restlessness is like water ruffled with wind. Uddha chakukucha. So the kukucha is the worry and the uddha cha is the restlessness water ruffled with wind. Back to sharing. So um, again, from the suttas, this is the Samyutta Nikaya, um, nourishment of restlessness and remorse. So how can we nourish um, this is unrest of mind, frequently giving unwise attention to it. That is the nourishment for the arising of restlessness and remorse that have not yet arisen and for the increasing and strengthening of restlessness and remorse that have not yet arisen. So we can also denourish it. There's quietude of mind, frequently giving wise attention to it. That is the denourishing of the arising of restlessness and remorse that have not yet arisen and of the increase and strengthening um, of restlessness and remorse that have already arisen. So quietude of mind, giving wise attention to it, getting curious, understanding it. Um, and from Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, six things that are conducive to the abandonment of restlessness and remorse. Knowledge of the Buddhist scriptures, so the teachings, really uh, remembering the teachings, uh, reading the suttas, asking questions about them, and familiarity with the Vinaya, so, so the, these are the ethics, like the precepts. Um, association with those mature in age and experience who possess dignity, restraint, and calm. So this could be your spiritual friend, your teacher, your therapist, um, someone that you feel, you know, kind of knows what's going on. Maybe they're not even a Dharma practitioner, but they know what's going on. They, they understand this. Maybe just spending more time with them. Noble friendship, the Kalyana Mita that I talked about. Suitable conversation. Yeah, so maybe talking it out with, with someone um, who gets it. And these things are also helpful in conquering restlessness and remorse. Um, the factors of absorption. 
so the the jhanas jhanas and but these can be cultivated too with um uh, the brahma viharas you know, loving kindness compassion joy and equanimity um, concentration of the spiritual faculties so deep deeper concentration tranquility concent concentration and equanimity of the factors of enlightenment so when the mind is restless it is not the proper time for cultivating the following factors of enlightenment it can be really difficult investigation of the doctrine energy and rapture because an agitated mind can hardly be quietened by them when the mind is restless it is the proper time for cultivating the following factors of enlightenment tranquility concentration and equanimity because an agitated mind can easily be quietened by them so tranquility concentration and equanimity And normally we can work through restlessness and worry through meditation. Um, simply being mindful and aware is a huge step, very important step. Um, so at least it gives us a better perspective. So even if we can't really stop it or change it or transform it or move beyond it or something like that in a skillful way, we can at least be with it and know that it's there. So that might be the practice for, for a while. I know it's here. And naming it already, I know for me, it brings like a sense of comfort or like awareness. And then that naming it starts to kind of cultivate that acceptance of what's here in the moment. Okay, so I don't like this. You can say that I don't like this. I really don't like this. It's not comfortable. It's not pleasant. I don't like this pain in my neck. I don't like this feeling I'm having, whatever is going on. Just knowing that and, and really acknowledging it for yourself rather than denying your own truth. You know, we often kind of think I should be mindful. I should be a good practitioner. I shouldn't feel these things. Right? But we're human. We're human and we all feel them. And so can we accept our humanity? Um, can we be with what is here? And can we you know, allow ourselves to be with it a little bit more in whatever capacity we have, little by little? Um, so the kind of trauma-informed way of practice is um, titration, which is drop by drop, step by step. As much as you can handle in that moment, you do that. Then you take a break. And you come back to it when you're ready. So it's not a forcing. It's not like a, you know, squeezing a stone. It's um, it's allowing. Um, it's being. So can we cultivate more of um, that energy? Um. So um, these are some tips from Jack Cornfield. Um, before I move on to practice. So he says, um, you might choose one of the uh, hindrances to work with, you know, in any given practice, any given week. For one week in your daily sitting, be particularly aware each time this state arises. Watch carefully for it. Notice how it begins and what precedes it. Notice if there's a particular thought or image that triggers the state. Notice how long it lasts and when it ends. Notice what state usually follows it. Observe whether it ever arises very slightly or softly. Can you see it as just a whisper of the mind, a whisper in the mind? See how loud and strong it gets. Notice what patterns of energy or tension reflect the state in the body. So the body is a really um, important place where we can notice what these energies feel like. Become aware of any physical or mental resistance to experiencing this state. Are we resisting it? Can we soften and receive even the resistance? even the resistance, soften and receive. 
And finally, sit and be aware of the breath, watching and waiting for this state, allowing it to come and observing it like an old friend, an old friend. Can we befriend? Can we actually befriend these energies and befriend ourselves as we engage with them? Um, Ajahn Brahm says, uh, we can practice with restlessness by cultivating more joy, more contentment in what she calls, um, or what they call kindfulness. So um, just acknowledging the sheer pleasure or the contentment or joy that we might receive when we sit in practice. Maybe allowing ourselves to feel joy and to savor joy when it arises, um, rather than being afraid it's going to leave us or being afraid it will never come. Um, that could be another way, another practice, um, cultivating joy and contentment. And this is also one of the factors of enlightenment. And so now um, we'll do some practice together. And just sitting um, in whatever way feels right for your body, whatever posture you need. You might wish to close the eyes or keep a soft gaze, hands resting on your lap. And really feeling first the body here, welcoming yourself into this space and into this practice. Acknowledging your presence, your intention to pay attention, to be in presence. Feeling the points of contact between the body and the ground, the support of the earth beneath you. And the body here resting, breathing. Alert, awake. Paying attention to the breath now, noticing the breath as it comes and goes, it enters and leaves the body. And breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. I'm aware of the qualities of the breath, the sensations of breathing. And the length, the temperature, the depth, and where you might feel the breath in the body as it comes and goes. Really observing, paying attention, getting really curious about the breath, 
as if you've never noticed it before. You might also begin to notice that the breath has this rhythm, rhythmic quality to it. Similar to the movement of the sea. It comes and it goes, enters and leaves the body. Really paying attention to that rhythm of the breath. Noticing how it changes from moment to moment. Maybe it's interesting to notice this, to pay attention to the rhythm, the coming and going, the rising and passing of each breath. Whenever the mind wanders, the attention gets pulled elsewhere. It's noticing this. And gently and kindly guiding the attention back, back to the breath. Letting go of any judgment about it. Just coming back, coming back to this rising and falling, this rhythm of the breath, these sensations of breathing.
paying attention to, to what is it that might take you away from the breath, take you away from the present moment, from the breath as an anchor connecting you with the present moment? What is it that holds your attention? Acknowledging what this is, being mindful of it, not resisting it, pushing it away, just accepting that this is here. Whenever you're ready, returning back, back to the breath. If there is a sense of restlessness or worry, can you notice what it feels like? Perhaps what it feels like in the body without resisting it or trying too hard or pushing it away. Just as the breath comes and goes, changes from moment to moment, all phenomena, all the energies and experiences and feelings are impermanent. They come and they go. perhaps even noticing this impermanent quality, the changing nature of whatever is here right now. Being patient with yourself, patient with this energy as it kind of runs its course. It might show up as some agitation in the body, kind of bouncing around or vibration. or it might show up as restlessness in the mind, a stream of thoughts all over the place with patience, with acceptance, really recognizing how it's showing up. Not wasting more energy on pushing it away, but just noticing it, being aware of it. And just sitting with it, noticing what happens just on its own as you're observing it. Maybe it settles or shifts or changes. And perhaps noticing when it's not present, when you, when you are present, 
physically, mentally, here with the breath in this moment and in this moment. In the last couple of minutes of this practice, really perhaps even noticing if there's been periods of joy or a kind of a subtle pleasantness about being in the present moment. Just feeling what it's like to be free for even a moment, even one breath and really savoring those moments, really appreciating them, however long they last, being with this sense of joy in presence,
And slowly now, whenever you're ready, releasing this practice, returning the attention back to the body in this posture, the points of contact between the body and the ground, the feeling of air on the skin, opening the eyes if they're closed and reorienting yourself to your space. Thank you everyone for your practice today. And we'll um, take a few moments, a few minutes to share. I'm gonna stop the recording now.